want to talk about protein synthesis today, and I cannot resist using this title, right? Because this is the real Lost in Translation, not the movie. It's much better than the movie. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> Nothing better than science. Science is the best. If, without science, you'd be dead. And you couldn't make movies. So it has to be the best. Protein synthesis. Now, remember, this is what every virus mRNA has to be ready to do, be translated by the host cell translation machinery. We've talked a lot about, in the Baltimore scheme, that molecule in the middle, mRNA. And we've said many times that viruses have to make mRNA that can be translated by the host cell apparatus. Viruses are totally dependent on the host cell for translation. They're parasites of the translation system. They need ribosomes, tRNAs, all the factors we're going to talk about today provided by the host cell. So you may be thinking, why do I care? Because this is a cellular process, and why, sh why should we learn about it? Aha, and that's where you would be wrong, because when a virus, I shouldn't say uses, but it's the quickest way to get to that point. When a virus uses something, it always changes it. It always modifies it in some way to suit its purposes. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how virus infections alter the protein synthesis apparatus of the host to favor their synthesis. And after we review the, the uh, existence of the, the translational apparatus, so you understand how it works, and we're all on the same line, then we're going to talk about how it's modified by the virus. Now, don't think that the cell doesn't respond back if a virus is modifying the translational system, causing stress on the cell. The host responds in turn. So we'll talk about what the host tries to do to shut down viral translation. So this is a continuing arms race, which we're going to talk about for the rest of this course, because we're almost done with replication now. We have one more discussion about assembly, and then we get into infection of organisms. And this whole arms race, this fight between viruses and hosts, will become really evident then. But today, the first time, we're going to really talk about what a virus does to the cell and what a cell does back. And so today's topic, protein synthesis, of course, applies to all viruses of the seven different genome types. They all make mRNA. The mRNA has to be translated, as I've said. But not every viral RNA is exactly the same, as you'll see. And viruses do things to alter translation to favor their synthesis. So let's start by looking at mRNA, which we've talked about a lot. We've talked about the cap structure at the 5' prime end when we talked about transcription. Here it is again to remind you, it is a base attached to the first base of the RNA with a five prime, five prime linkage. So it's basically a base turned around rather than five to three prime, typically a G. And it's methylated. So we call this an M7G because it's methylated on the seventh position of the base. Uh, M7G, PPP, and then whatever the next base is. Typically the next two bases also get methylation as part of the cap structure. The cap, as you'll see today, is really important for efficient translation of mRNAs, but it's also important for processing of RNAs, splicing, transport out of the nucleus, and the stability of mRNAs, topics we haven't talked a lot about uh, in this course. Today we're going to look at how it's required for efficient translation. Let's look at an mRNA, a typical mRNA in some detail. So we have the cap at the 5' prime end. It's followed by a, what we call a 5' prime UTR untranslated region or non-coding region. Either one works. They, are, they can be anywhere from a couple of nucleotides to over 1,000 nucleotides in length. They're typically between 50 and 70. When they get long, it's unusual. 1,000 bases are longer. It's very unusual for a 5' prime UTR for reasons you'll see in a moment. This 5' prime UTR often contains a lot of RNA secondary structure, stem loops and so forth that we've talked about in this course. And the more secondary structure, the more difficult it is for a ribosome to get through it. As we'll see in a moment, the ribosome first interacts with the cap and then has to find the initiation codon or the AUG. So the length of the UTR and its secondary structure will influence translation efficiency. And we have an open reading frame, which begins with an AUG most of the time, but not all the time, as you will see, can be other bases, which encodes a protein. And then we have a stop codon to signal the ribosome to stop translating. And then we have a three prime non-coding region or a three prime untranslated region. This also can 
regulate initiation of translation, it can re regulate translation efficiency, it can regulate the stability uh, of the mRNA. Remember, we said a while ago when we talked about transcription, not all, R all RNAs don't have to exist forever. So they have signals built into them uh, to make them degrade quicker or slower. Then we have a poly A tail at the three prime end, which is needed for efficient translation. And why it is needed, we'll see uh, today. Okay, the translational machinery, just to review, you should all know this really well, or at least somewhat, because you've had this before, at least in high school, I would think. Um, and of course, the translation machinery in eukaryotes is the ADS ribosome, the turkey, right there on the upper left, which composed of 40S and 60S subunits. And these are made up of ribosomal RNAs and proteins. There's quite a few of them. There's uh, there's uh, 18S in the 40S subunit, 28.5 and 5S in the large subunit. Then we have about 80 proteins making up both. The proteins have a secondary role. It's actually the RNA that catalyzes uh, protein synthesis. You can take away most of the proteins and the RNA will still make a protein, which is another tip of the hat to the RNA world. The RNA world was here first and then it transitioned to a protein world. Uh, so things evolved early on that could make proteins with very few proteins because you can't make proteins when you don't have a lot of them, obviously. Okay, ribosomes, then we have tRNAs, of course, which uh, have a place at one end to join up a single amino acid and then a place at the other end, the anticodon, to read the code on the mRNA and put the right amino acid in. These are made by amino acyl tRNA synthetases, very important enzymes to, because they have to put the right amino acid on the right tRNA. If they don't, the whole code gets messed up. Uh, then we have a whole bunch of other proteins that are involved in translation, and we're going to talk about some of them today. There are initiation proteins, elongation proteins, and termination proteins. So we divide translation into three distinct steps. These are called uh, IFs for initiation, EFs for elongation, and then the terminators are RFs. The E stands for eukaryotic because there are orthologs in prokaryotes, and uh, they would be called um, just IFs or EFs or RFs. We'll talk about what some of those do in translation today. So there are two major ways that mRNAs are translated. The first, which was the one first discovered, is called 5 prime N dependent initiation. It's called that because you need a 5 prime end with a cap in order to carry it out. What happens is you have 40S subunits floating around in the cytoplasm of the cell. And these subunits associate with a number of initiation factors. These are all EIFs. You can see EIF1A, EIF3. Uh, and then in a series of steps, uh, the tRNA, the initiating tRNA, joins the 40S subunit. And that tRNA, it's a very special one, the methionine tRNA, uh, is associated with a number of other molecules, in particular EIF1 and EIF2 with GTP on it. That's called the ternary complex because there are three components, very simple. It joins up with the 40S subunit. Then we have another series of initiation proteins, including this big red one here, EIF4G, uh, EIF4A. We'll talk about some of these in terms of their roles. Now you have a very big complex here. And then this finally finds an mRNA. And the way it does so is that one of the components of this complex called EIF4E is a cap binding protein. It specifically binds the cap. All right, so a cap protein interaction brings the 40S subunit to the 5' prime end of the RNA. That's why a cap is so important for translation efficiency because the whole system is geared to recognize a cap via this EIF4E protein. So now we've got this whole initiation complex formed at the five prime end of the, of the mRNA. But that's typically not where translation begins. Translation begins in AUG, which can be close or can be a thousand bases away. So somehow this complex has to find it. You may be already thinking, do I have to memorize all of these proteins? And the answer is no, you don't. You have to memorize the principles. And what's a main principle? that the cap brings in the ribosome through a series of protein-protein interactions, all right? That's really what you need to know. Uh, I wouldn't expect that you remember what EIF4G does, but you should know that it's a bridging protein, for example. There's a protein that bridges 4E with 
uh, the EIF3 and the 4DS. So here, in five prime dependent initiation, we're looking at how the uh, ribosome was brought to the RNA. You can see uh, this protein is binding the cap EIF4E. 4E in turn binds EIF4G. 4G in turn binds EIF3, and 3 binds the 4DS subunit. So all you need to know is there are a series of protein-protein interactions that recruit the 4DS subunit via the cap. So the cap is really important. And some viruses don't have caps. Some of them have VPG at their five prime end. You may remember that VPG is the primer for RNA synthesis of poliovirus. It's, al it's also the primer for RNA synthesis of many other viruses. So because mRNA and genome RNA for these viruses are the same thing, there's no way to have a cap there. So instead, VPG can bind 4E in some viruses, not all. In some viruses, VPG will bind the cap, and that's how 5 prime independent translation goes in those viruses that do not have a cap, or at least in some of them. We'll talk about some other ways that can happen as well. Now, this protein, EIF4G, is big. It's over 200,000 Daltons in molecular weight, and it's very important. It has a lot of binding sites as you might guess, for EIF4E, for EIF3, for EIF4A, which is a helicase that we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and let's see what else we have. Poly A binding protein site also. So the EIF4G protein is shown at the top as a linear diagram. And you can see all the binding sites for the different proteins that it interacts with. So it's really important for um, translation. It also turns out to be the target of a viral protease shown in this red diamond or arrowhead there at the top. And that cleavage by that viral protease inactivates EIF4G. We're going to talk about this later today, but it is a point of regulation of translation by viruses. So that's how the, the ribosome uh, gets to the 5 prime end. We also believe that efficient translation requires the 3 prime end to be present near the 5 prime end of where this initiation complex is forming. We call this juxtaposition of mRNA ends. It happens in several ways, depending on the situation in cells, and many virus-infected cells, but also uninfected cells. The situation on the top occurs. We have EIF4E bringing the cap, uh, sorry, binding the cap and bringing the 4DS subunit in. In addition, the poly A binding protein binds EIF4G. There's a site on 4G where PABP binds. PABP is a cellular protein that binds poly A. And so that interaction essentially brings the 3 prime end of the RNA right near the 5 prime end where this initiation complex is forming. And we think, and experiments have shown, that this is needed for efficient translation. You can disrupt this juxtaposition experimentally, and it reduces the efficiency of translation. We're not sure why it needs to be in this configuration, maybe that ribosomes can keep going around in circles like a clock and not have to fall off and reinitiate, but we don't really know. Now, uh, some viral genomes achieve the same juxtaposition in different ways. Here's a cool example of two plant viral RNAs, which probably I show you because I love their names, P. enation mosaic virus and barley yellow dwarf virus. The plant virologists are very creative at naming their virus after the diseases that the viruses cause in plants. Anyway, these are the viral, this is one viral RNA uh, of these two viruses. Here's the 5 prime end and the AUG initiation codon, but the initiation complex actually forms at the 3 prime end of the viral RNA. So you can see here uh, EIF4G and EIF3. EIF3 is binding the RNA at the 3 prime end, and that brings in the 4DS subunit. Then there's a long range interaction between two stem loops, one at the 3 prime end and one at the 5 prime end, and that actually brings the initiation complex to the AUG. This is called a site, a cap independent translational enhancer, because these RNAs are not capped. So they can't recruit the initiation complex to the cap. There isn't one. So what they do instead is to have a separate nucleation site at the 3 prime end, and then RNA-RNA interactions bring that to the AUG. We'll see some other examples of how you can translate without a cap in a moment. All right, so back to the RNA that's about to be translated. We've established an initiation complex at the 5 prime end by uh, being recruited to the cap. Now the next thing we have to do is reach the AUG in order to start translating that open reading frame. As I said, sometimes the ribosome or this initiation complex has to move quite long distances. 
And these long distances, which are part of the untranslated region, often have secondary structure, shown schematically here by this stem loop. So some RNAs don't have very much secondary structure. Others have quite a bit. Secondary structure inhibits the movement of this uh, initiation complex to the AUG. And so there is a protein in this complex that actually unwinds the secondary structure. That's EIF4A here, this green bar. And that is an energy-dependent reaction. It requires hydrolysis of ATP in order to uh, unwind uh, the RNA. Now, if you're designing an RNA for produ production of a protein, say, in a cell, you don't want to have any structure in the 5' end. That'll give you maximum production. But cells, many mRNAs have secondary structure to regulate the protein production. You don't want to have too much. You don't want to have maximum amount of every protein. So this is one way of regulating it. Eventually, this complex reaches the AUG. Of course, we think it has to let go of the cap at some point, but we're not sure how that happens. So now the 40S subunit has found the AUG. That met initiator tRNA has the right anticodon to match the AUG. Uh, and that is an event that is sensed. Okay, the, the base pairing is sensed, and that leads to the release of a number of these proteins that are bound, some of these other proteins that are bound. It, it causes the hydrolysis of this GTP molecule that is bound to uh, the ternary complex. And we end up with uh, a, a large subunit coming in, and now we have 60S and 40S subunits with the tRNA met at the uh, initiation site, ready to make protein. All these other uh, proteins have fallen off when the tRNA matches the codon. So these 60S subunits are also floating around unpaired in the cell, and they join only when a 40S and a tRNA find an initiation codon. And then we're ready to start protein synthesis. First question, which statement about the 5' prime cap on mRNA is incorrect? It consists of M7G joined to second nucleotide of RNA by an unusual 5 prime, 5 prime linkage. It's present on most cellular mRNAs. It's required for efficient translation. It binds the cap binding protein. It's found on mRNA, but not pre-mRNA, which is wrong. The answer is E. That's wrong. It's found on mRNA, but not pre-mRNA. The cap is added, if you remember from two lectures ago, the cap is added after about 20 bases of mRNA are made in the nucleus. So it's definitely present on mRNA and pre-mRNA. So that's not wrong. It's present on most cellular mRNAs, that's correct. It's required for efficient translation, absolutely. The, the um, ribosome can't bind the mRNA without a cap. It binds the cap binding protein, that's correct. So it is found on mRNA, but not pre-mRNA. It is the right answer. That is, um, what most cells do in terms of translation, uh, five prime end dependent translation using that basic mechanism that we've just gone over briefly. Now viruses, many viruses, their mRNAs are translated by the same mechanism. And there's no point in going over those because we just have gone over it. But what I want to tell you about is other mechanisms for decoding that have been found in virus infected cells. They twist the system to, be, to do slightly different things and favor their own translation. And there are a number of them that we're going to talk about which are illustrated uh, on this slide. First one is called ribosome shunting. This happens in adenovirus mRNAs. Some of the adenovirus mRNAs uh, do an unusual form of translation given this name. And here's an experiment that illustrates this. What we've done here is we've taken, in green is the five prime leader of the late mRNAs of adenovirus. These are, this is leader, is called a five prime leader or a tripartite leader because it's spliced from three different parts of the pre-mRNA. But basically on adenovirus, late mRNAs, it's present before the AUG. And now what has been done in this experiment is this leader has been spliced to a protein that can be easily assayed by a Western blot. So that it's a different viral protein, it doesn't matter. So if you take this RNA and you translate it in a cell, for example, or in vitro, it doesn't really matter, uh, you see that it translates pretty well. Wild type is the first lane here. You get two protein products. Despite having all this secondary structure, it's pretty unusual. In fact, if you put a really stable stem loop structure uh, here, right near the AUG, you still get translation. And this uh, red stem loop structure has a 
stability of minus 80 kilocalories per mole, which a ribosome cannot unwind. So there are limits to what that helicase can do during scanning. And 80 kilocalories is about the limit. So that red should stop translation by scanning. So the implication is here that ribosomes must not be going through this secondary structure. Now the last experiment, we put the same stem loop at the five prime end of the non-coding region. And now you see it's blocking translation. So there must be a little bit of scanning here and then something else is happening because it's the ribosomes are certainly not scanning through the whole five prime UTR because that red stem loop is not blocking them. If we put this red stem loop in any other message, a UTR, it would block translation. So what's going on? Well, the mechanism is ribosome shunting. What we think is happening is that the ribosomes bind the cap. If you remember, there was a cap at the five prime end of that message. Scans a little bit, and that's why putting in that first stem loop blocks translation. But then uh, the ribosome can somehow make it to the AUG without scanning. So we think that that five prime UTR is highly structured in a way that brings one of those early stem loops right next to the AUG. So the ribosome just moves across all the secondary structures, basically bypassing it and getting to that first AUG molecule. So that's shunting. It's bypassing all the secondary structure. So adenovirus, uh, late mRNAs have that. Plant coleomoviruses that we talked about last time do a similar thing, and other virus mRNAs from uh, paramyxoviruses do it as well. And you may be thinking, why would viruses bother to do this, well, the shunting is predicted to decrease the dependence of mRNAs on that whole initiation complex, including the helicase during initiation. So and under conditions where maybe the cell is shutting down helicase activity as a way to avoid virus infection, the virus will get around it by not needing unwinding and by just being able to shunt over these secondary structures. All right, so ribosome shunting. Another interesting mechanism is called internal initiation. So poliovirus and related viruses, remember, have a small protein at the five prime end called VPG. They don't have a cap, so these cannot be de translated in a cap-dependent mechanism. When the viral genome was sequenced many years ago uh, in the 1980s, the methionine codon that was used for initiation was found at about base 742. And it was a long, long untranslated region full of AUG codons, which is very unusual because ribosomes scan, they're likely to be fooled by those upstream AUGs. So how did this get translated? Well, it turns out it's by internal initiation. The ribosomes actually bind beyond the five prime end close to the AUG. And here's an experiment that illustrated that. It's a classic experiment. Some investigators uh, made a variety, two different mRNAs and translated them in vitro. And one mRNA, both mRNAs have uh, encode two different proteins. They're called TK and CAT. And the mRNA in the upper left, it's capped, it's polyadenylated. If you put it into cells or into a cell-free extract, mostly you'll get translation of the first protein, the TK, and very little of the second because uh, on eukaryotic messages, once ribosomes reach a terminator, they fall off. They don't go beyond it. So they can't make two proteins from one mRNA. You get very little of the second protein. Uh, if you make an mRNA and you take the five prime non-coding region of the poliovirus, which I just showed you, you stick it in between the two protein coding regions, now you get a lot of both proteins made. You get a lot of TK and you get a lot of CAT made. And that's because ribosomes can bind directly to this five prime non-coding non -coding region of poliovirus and reach the ribosome. They don't have to scan through the entire message in order to reach that, the AUG of the cat protein. In a second separate experiment, the same experiment was done except they used poliovirus infected cells. And what, we'll, what you'll see later is that poliovirus infection leads to shut down or shut off of cap dependent translation. So this message on the lower left when put into poliovirus infected cells, there is absolutely zero protein made because the ribosomes cannot load onto the five prime end. There's no TK made, there's no CAT made. However, if you use the second RNA with the five prime UTR of poliovirus, you now get good production of the CAT protein because the ribosomes can still bind internally to that sequence. So that proved that this was what they would then, they then called this sequence from the five prime end an internal ribosome entry site or iris 
Irises are very useful nowadays if you want to make more than one protein from a message in a eukaryotic system, because eukaryotes don't do that typically. If you make messages like the one in the upper left, with a protein followed by a spacer, followed by another protein coding region, you won't get the second protein made. The ribosomes won't reach it. You have to put it in iris, and you can buy these sequences and, and use them for that purpose. An experiment was done later to actually show that you don't need a five prime end for an iris to work, because that is what the corollary is. The ribosomes are not binding to the five prime end at all. There's no cap, they're binding internally. So investigators made a circular RNA, one without an iris and one with an iris. So we have an AUG, a stop codon in both. The circular RNA without the iris, you get no protein. Why? Because ribosomes can't bind to it. They need a five prime cap in order to initiate translation. But the iris doesn't need a five prime cap. The, ri the ribosomes bind internally to the uh, sequence and can easily initiate translation. You get protein made. Kind of really a nice experiment. So these are now found in many different viral genomes, not just that of poliovirus. And here are just some different examples of these irises. And they're divided into types, which is not important for you. They just have different kinds of structures. Here's on the upper left is the poliovirus iris that I've just talked to you about. You can see it's a very highly structured region. It has lots of stem loops, and not just simple stem loops, but extended ones with lots of internal stems and bulges. So that's uh, poliovirus. Then we have type 2 iris from other picornaviruses, which you can see is different. Uh, there's a type 3 iris from hepatitis C virus. The type 4 is from an insect virus. So they all have different secondary structures. In fact, they all have different sequences. And you can't find an iris at a, in a sequence by looking at the sequence because there's no signature. It's actually the secondary structure that's important. And the only way you can tell if a sequence has internal ribosome binding ability is to do an experiment. Now, the way these work some of them anyway, is that they recruit EIF4G directly. So here on this iris, EIF4G binds to this structured region shown here, part of stem loop uh, JK. So instead of the EIF4E protein binding a cap, there's no cap on these mRNAs, the EIF4G binds the iris directly, and that will bring in the ribosome. We have that shown here. So on the top is how 5 prime N dependent translation occurs in our cells. For e, EIF4E is brought to the cap, it binds the cap, and then, of course, it brings in the 40S subunit via EIF4G. Now, the irises, at least of poliovirus and related viruses, 4G binds the iris directly and brings in the 40S subunit via EIF3. There's no cap, there's no binding of the N-terminus. Now, you see the N-terminus of 4G is falling off there, and that's actually what some viruses do it. They cleave the N-terminus of EIF4G so that it can no longer bind the cap binding protein EIF4E. So, so translation in the cell is shut down. It's a brilliant strategy. So you cleave 4G. The cell can't make protein, but the virus can because it doesn't need the cap. It can bind, uh, 4G can bind the iris directly. Hepatitis C virus is interesting because apparently the iris can bind uh, EIF three directly, which then will bring in the 40S subunit. You don't even need EIF4G. <clears throat> so this may be a very old strategy for binding the ribosome. Maybe you know just after the RNA world, when proteins began to be made, these kinds of elements arose that could bind uh, the 40S subunit only with an intervening protein EIF3. So those are some ways that you can get to bind a 5 prime end without having a cap, which many viruses do not have. Our next question, what do ribosome shunting and internal ribosome initiation have in common? Cap recruitment of the 40S subunit, both involve RNA secondary structures, ribosome scanning through the entire 5' prime UTR, both require cap binding protein EIF4E or all of the above. What do they have in common? So the answer is B, both involve RNA secondary structures. The iris doesn't need a cap, so that can't be right. Ribosome scanning through the entire 5' prime UTR. Not right for either one, actually. There's no scanning through the entire. The, the ribosome shunting bypasses a lot of the 5' prime UTR, and the iris binds internally. Um, only the ribosome scanning requires EIF4E. So that's why B is the right answer.
All right, so whether an initiation occurs by cap binding, 5' independent initiation via the cap, or internal ribosome entry via an iris, in the end, what we have is the ribosome positioned on the initiating codon. You have a MET tRNA in the P site. Now remember, the ribosome has three functional sites. The P, or the peptidyl site, that's where the bond is going to be made between the amino acid and the rest of the protein. The A is the amino acyl site. That's where the next amino acid will come in. And the E is the exit site. Once the amino acid is transferred from the tRNA to the growing protein chain, it's going to be moved away. It goes to the E site and then falls off. All right, so the, as I said, the majority of initiations occur um, on AUG codons. But there are some examples of methionine independent initiation in virus-infected cells I want to tell you about. It's quite interesting. And one of them involves a virus called cricket paralysis virus, which is in the same family of poliovirus, as you might guess. Poliovirus, of course, causes paralysis of people. Cricket paralysis virus causes paralysis of crickets. Apparently, this was discovered in Australia one day when a farmer walked out and found thousands of paralyzed crickets in his field. And eventually, the virus was isolated from these crickets. Uh, some people are trying to use it as a uh, pest control virus. Anyway, it's an RNA virus. It has, a, it has an interesting genome. There's an internal ribosome entry site at the 5' end. There's a VPG at the 5' end, so there's no cap. So it has to have some way of getting around that. It has an iris at the 5' end, which will recruit the ribosomes. Long open reading frame. And then a second internal ribosome entry site in the middle, which drives uh, protein synthesis of a second open reading frame. So this virus genome has two irises rather than one. So uh, ribosomes bind internally at the first and the second iris. What's unusual about the second iris is that it structure mimics that of a MET initiator tRNA, and that's shown on the right. So you see there's the, the A site, uh, of the, the P site of the ribosome there, and the, uh, the RNA folds to look like a tRNA, and the ribosome thinks it's a tRNA and binds to it. Both subunits bind, and then the next amino acid is put in. So you don't need an initiator tRNA for that. And also, this happens at a non-AUG codon. See, it happens at a CCU, which is a proline codon. So the, the first amino acid that will actually be put on this protein is the next one, which is an alanine in this case. Uh, this is interesting, well, because it's different from what we naturally consider to be initiation. It's not using a tRNA. The RNA is mimicking a tRNA. And we wonder how many proteins in our genome do this. Because, you know, when we estimate the coding capacity of eukaryotic genomes. We look for open reading frames that begin with the methionine. Well, maybe they don't all begin with the methionine. Maybe some of the, TR, some of the RNAs can fold in this way to mimic a tRNA. Anyway, that's one way of doing methionine independent initiation. And another virus, a plant virus, turnip yellow mosaic virus, it's a, it's a plant virus with an RNA genome that happens to be a capped, um, and instead, again, instead of using a methionine initiator, so it has a cap, so it can recruit the translation apparatus uh, by the usual methods, 5 prime end dependent methods. But the 3 prime end of this viral RNA folds into a tRNA-like structure. And it's so authentic that it's actually uh, charged with valine by the cells, by the um, synthetase of the cell. And this uh, base pairs with the initiator code. It looks like an initiating tRNA to the ribosome. And so again, you have non-AUG initiation caused by mimicry of the RNA. So two cases where we have mimicry. This is not an internal ribosome entry site. It's just another way of using 5' independent initiation at a non-AUG site. So initiation doesn't have to be at AUGs. We have another limitation in eukaryotic cells. And that is, as I, I mentioned or alluded to before, ribosomes cannot make more than one protein from a single message. We call that monocystronic. So eukaryotic mRNAs typically have a single open reading frame and code for one protein. In contrast, bacteria and archaeal mRNAs are polycystronic. You can have multiple open reading frames on a single mRNA and make multiple proteins. You've probably heard about this. 
This is because the rib right around the AUG is a sequence that the ribosome can interact with. Remember what that's called? Named after two Australians? Shine del Garno, that's right. And uh, that's the sequence complementary to the ribosomal RNA that brings it to a region right near the AUG. So you have one around each AUG. So ribosomes basically are binding internally and they can translate it. But eukaryotes don't have that. As you saw, some viruses can do that. So that's how they get around this monocystronic limitation. But it's a big limitation for viruses that have small genomes. And so evolution has provided ways to get around this limitation, to get around the monocystronic limitation of eukaryotic messages. Now I want to tell you some examples of how that happens, because they're pretty interesting. And uh, here they are listed. You don't need to remember which virus does what. I just want you to understand the concepts involved. We'll talk about just a few of these, not all of them. We've already talked about uh, having internal initiation. You can have two open reading frames on a message when you have an internal ribosome entry site. So that's pretty straightforward. You can make a polyprotein. You can make individual mRNAs. You can have a segmented genome. Hey, if you have one mRNA and you can only make one protein, why, you break up the mRNA into, into segments. And you can make lots of proteins that way. You can do splicing. And then we have a few interesting ones, leaky scanning, reinitiation, suppression, and ribosomal frame shifting. And so these happen in many different viruses, as you can see. So let's go through a few of them. So you're stuck with one RNA, polioviruses, flaviviruses. What do you do? If it's a plus-stranded RNA, uh, you, you have a problem because you can only one, make one protein. Uh, well, the viruses have evolved to make one protein and then encode a protease that cleaves it into smaller bits, and therefore you can get multiple proteins. Polioviruses can do that. We have a single open reading frame. We make a long protein. The protein contains two proteases. They're called 3C and 2A. These proteases can clip themselves out of the protein precursor, and then they can go and start chopping up the rest of it. And the result is you have about a dozen proteins that are useful. So that's one way to get around one protein per mRNA is to make a polyprotein. The flaviviruses like Zika and Dengue do the same thing. They make a polyprotein, and it's cleaved. In the case of the flavies, uh, it's by a, both a viral protein and cellular proteases do the cleaving. Another one is leaky scanning. Here's an example of an mRNA from a paramyxovirus that can encode one, two, three, four, five uh, different proteins. So at the, at the five prime end is a cap. Ribosomes bind the cap. They start scanning. They reach an ACG at base 81. So ACG is not an AUG, but ribosomes will recognize it and initiate. And um, it's not very efficient. So maybe 5% of the ribosomes will make a protein. This one here, C prime, 215 amino acids. Most of the other um, ribosomes will keep going. They reach a second, an AUG codon at base 104. So that's an initiator, but it's not in a good context. What do I mean by that? So it's not only the AUG that's important for initiation. The surrounding sequences can affect efficiency. And there's an optimal context and a suboptimal context. So this one at 104 has a suboptimal context, so only about 10% of the ribosomes initiate there. They make a very different protein, it's P. It's in a different reading frame, which is why it's pink. So we, so far we have two proteins. Again, those, most of the ribosomes continue scanning, and they reach a, third, a second AUG codon at 114. This is in a good context, so they mostly initiate there, and they make a third protein, C. Uh, then there are two AUG codons downstream, and these are reached by shunting. So a fraction of the ribosomes load on the 5 prime end and shunt over all this and end up at AUGs at 183 and 201. So we have very, very interesting mRNA. One mRNA can encode multiple proteins because the scanning process by which a ribosome moves down the RNA and looks for initiators isn't perfect. It can be regulated. So you can use that flexibility to make more than one protein from an mRNA. And we have suppression of termination. Let's talk about termination. We didn't talk about that before. When protein synthesis is over, what signals that it's over? It's a termination codon, right? So here we have, and you know, there are three different kinds of termination codons, UAA, UAG, and UA, UGA. And here uh, we have a, a ribosome moving down an mRNA. It's got a nice polypeptide chain that's made. And you see the UAA termination codon is next. 
And so what happens is there are termination proteins called ERF1 and ERF3. They look like tRNAs. They fit right into this A site, and they recognize termination codons. So these are proteins that mimic tRNAs. Right? So they recognize the termination codon. They sit in there, and then they cause the release of the polypeptide, so no more translation can occur, and the ribosomal subunits fall off. And that termination requires energy. This GTP is going to be hydrolyzed. So it's a very cool mimicry. It's molecular mimicry. This protein is mimicking a tRNA. It's fitting into the uh, A site. And if there is a terminator there, that stops protein synthesis. Now, sometimes these stop codons can be recognized by bona fide tRNAs, and an, and an amino acid can be inserted. If you think about that, then translation can continue as long as there's an open reading frame until you reach another stop codon. Sometimes um, there's misreading. Sometimes tRNAs with an anticodon that's close to UAA misread the, the stop codon, and they put a, an amino acid in there. So that's misreading. Uh, or we have special tRNAs in the cell that uh, are recognizing suppressor codons. Like there's a tRNA that is bound to selenocysteine. It's a special, very rare amino acid, and that will recognize UGA. So at a very low frequency, you can put amino acids in when there's a stop codon. So viruses take advantage of this to decode their genomes. It happens in cells too, of course. And there are two examples I want to tell you about because they, one of them explains an a, a observation that we talked about last time, and that's in the retroviral genome. Uh, on the left, the unspliced mRNA produced from retrovirus proviral DNA, which we talked about last time, is translated at the 5' end uh, to produce the GAG protein. But it, the ribosomes mostly stop at the end of GAG. There's a termination code on there. Uh, now, GAG makes structural proteins of the virus, but it certainly needs polymerase. The polymerase region encodes the reverse transcriptase, RNase H, and the integrase. The way the Paul gene is accessed is by suppressing uh, the stop codon between the GAG and the Paul regions. So about 10% of the time, ribosomes are going down this message. Uh, this tRNA is suppressed. And the way it works is that a regular tRNA misreads the stop codon and inserts an amino acid, and then you get the whole protein made. You get a gag Paul fusion protein, which can then be cleaved by proteases later. Right? So this area has an interesting secondary structure. So here is the termination pro uh, codon at the left here, UAG. And what we think happens is a stem loop structure. And in fact, it's actually a pseudo knot. You see the loop is base pairing with a downstream sequence. We think the ribosome bumps into this, and that gives it extra time for a suppressor tRNA to move in. Again, it's a normal tRNA misreading this uh, stop codon. So that's retroviral suppression. On the right is alpha virus suppression. These are plus-stranded RNA viruses where there is uh, a, a capped message that's initially translated in the infected cell to give this protein P1 through 3. There's a stop codon at the end of the P123 protein. Um, but you, again, about 10% of the time, that stop codon is suppressed by a normal tRNA that misreads. And you make a slightly longer protein, uh, which is important because NSP4, that, the protein that results from the suppression, is actually uh, the viral RNA polymerase. So you need to make a little bit of this protein. You don't need a huge amount because it's catalytic, but read-through translation produces that. All right, so two examples, and there are many, many more. Two examples where suppression can expand uh, the coding capacity of your genome. Another one is very cool is ribosomal frame shifting. And this happens also in retroviruses. And these are different retroviruses. Remember, I just told you that that long mRNA of retroviruses encodes gag and pole proteins. And we just saw how suppression can give you a gag pol fusion protein. Sometimes it's achieved by ribosomal frame shifting. The, the gag and the pol proteins are in two different reading frames, but the sequence around this area in some retroviruses is such that ribosomes pause, they back up one base into a different reading frame, and then they can continue to translate. And now you get a single protein made. So you've overcome the stop codon. I'll show you how that happens in a moment. And instead, make a long fusion protein. It's called frame shifting because the ribosomes stop. They move back minus one 
And in other systems, they can move back minus two. This is a minus one frame shifting. That shifts the reading frame and no longer engages the stop codon. You keep translating until you get to the end of the Paul gene. You make a fusion, gag Paul fusion, which is then cleaved again to give gag proteins and RT, et cetera. This has been studied like crazy because it happens not only in virus infected cells, it happens in bacteria as well. It's a way to get more uh, protein out of a coding region. So here's one way that we think it happens. Here is on the upper left, a ribosome translating an mRNA. And we have two tRNAs here. We have a tRNA in the P site and the growing polypeptide chain is shown above it with the different amino acids. And then we have a new tRNA sitting in the A site with an amino acid leucine uh, brought in. And you can see there's a stop code on next, UAG. So what happens is there's a signal in the RNA, it could be a stem loop, for example, that somehow makes the ribosome pause and back up one base, exactly one base. So it's called tRNA slippage. So now when you back up one base, you know, the sequence around this is optimized for frame shifting because you can see that there's pretty good base pairing between the tRNAs and the mRNA still. There is just one mismatch, right? That AA mismatch there, but it doesn't seem to hurt things. And now, if you were to put a, a tRNA in, it would be an AUA, and it's not a stop codon. So you have avoided the stop codon by shifting back one base. So what happens here, after that slippage, uh, the peptide is transferred uh, to the tRNA on the A site. That's the normal function. And then the next tRNA comes in, which is UAU here. It's matching the AUA. So you slip back one, you avoid the UAG, and you know, you're not terminating anymore, and it can keep translating. And the next stop codon is at the end of the Paul protein. Really very, very clever way to get uh, more proteins out of your mRNA, ribosomal frame shifting. Our next question, compared with a polycystronic mRNA, a monocystronic RNA does not require an AUG start codon, does not bind the 40S ribosomal subunit, has only one open reading frame, is only found in viruses and bacteria, all of the above. All right, the answer is C, has only one open reading frame. It's the simplest answer, and that's correct. Some of you said is only found in viruses and bacteria. That's not correct. And all of the above is not correct either. So um, we just talked about interesting ways, just a few ways of getting over the one mRNA, one protein rule in eukaryotic cells. And again, viruses of bacteria don't have to worry about that because they, they, can, do, they can make multiple proteins from a single mRNA. The host is able to do that already. All right, now the last bit today, I want to talk about regulation of translation. And you have to memorize this table, okay? Uh, not really. You just have to memorize the color. So which color is the most in this table? Blue, red, or green? It's obviously blue. And that matches initiation. These are all mechanisms of regulation, of initiation, elongation, and termination that we know of. And you can see most of them are at the initiation step. These are ways that virus infections regulate translation. So you can see that the initiation step is the most targeted. It is the rate limiting step, although there are ways to, to regulate elongation and termination. But we're gonna go over a few interesting examples of how initiation is regulated. So the idea here is the virus would like to have the whole translation machinery at its disposal. In the hell with cellular mRNAs, get rid of them. So it will try and regulate translation to do that. Now, a key point in initiation that is the subject of extensive regulation is shown on this slide, and that involves the recycling of the ternary complex. So if you remember from earlier today, the ribosome is brought to the cap on the 5 prime end by EIF4E interactions, it then moves down to the AUG. And one of the components of that initiation complex that's moving down is the ternary complex, MET-tRNA, EIF2-GTP, and EIF1. When the AUG codon is found, you have GTP hydrolysis, and that releases initiation proteins. The 60S subunit comes in, you start translating. Eventually, that uh, EIF2 comes off, comes off after it, it's, the GTP is hydrolyzed, 
and it has to be recycled. You have to replace the GDP with a GTP so that it can go through and bind another ternary complex and go through translation initiation again. And so that happens in the following way. Here's the GDP EIF2 complex. It binds a protein initiation protein called EIF2B. You see nice little pockets for both the GDP and the EIF2 in that protein. And EIF2B acts as a guanine exchange protein. It will exchange GDP for GTP. So it releases GDP and pulls in a molecule of GTP. And now we have brand new EIF2 GTP, which can bind a MET tRNA and then go through another round of translation. This is a rate limiting step in translation. There's not a lot of EIF2B in the cell. And you can regulate translation by controlling it. And there are proteins in our cells. In our uninfected cells, there are at least three kinases, protein kinases, that regulate the activity of EIF2B. They're called EIF2-alpha kinases because they don't actually phosphorylate EIF2B. They phosphorylate a subunit of EIF2, the blue protein here, called EIF2-alpha. Uh, and they respond, these protein kinases respond to different kinds of situations in the cell. For example, one of them is called PERC. That's the name of the protein kinase that phosphorylates EIF2. It responds to stress in the endoplasmic reticulum. So if a virus is making a ton of glycoprotein in the ER in preparation for making new virus particles, that puts stress on the cell. And this uh, protein kinase PERC gets activated and it phosphorylates EIF2. Uh, another one is GCN2, which responds to starvation. Amino acid deprivation uh, it leads to activation of GCN2, which will phosphorylate EIF2. If you don't have enough amino acids around, you don't want to be making proteins, right? So the cell shuts down its protein synthesizing machinery. And also, uh, there's a protein kinase called PKR, which is relevant to virus infection which responds to double-stranded RNA, which is made by virus infection. In most uninfected cells, there's no double-stranded RNA around. It's made mainly when viruses infect cells. So PKR is a sensor of double-stranded RNA. And when it senses it, in a mechanism I'm going to tell you about in a moment, it uh, gets activated and phosphorylates EIF2. So the consequence of phosphorylating EIF2 is shown here. Here is EIF2 in blue bound to GDP. It gets a phosphate put on it. When it then binds EIF2B, it, the GDP uh, doesn't come out. Okay, So basically, eventually, you will bind up all the EIF2B with phosphorylated EIF2 GDP. You will not be able to recycle the GDP out for GTP. Uh, and translation is inhibited, because you have no more EIF2 GTP to make a ternary complex. So that is all you basically inhibit protein synthesis at the initiation step by uh, phosphorylating EIF2-alpha in response to these conditions in a cell. Now, in a virus-infected cell, you make double-stranded RNA. Whether you're a DNA or RNA virus, you can make double-stranded RNA. RNA viruses, when you replicate your genome, you're making double-stranded RNA. The DNA viruses, you can have convergent transcription on both strands of the DNA, and those are complementary RNAs that will hybridize. So when you make a double-stranded RNA in a, in a cell, it binds PKR. PKR is present in a cell in an inactive form. It's not able to phosphorylate anything. When it's activated by double-stranded RNA, it can then phosphorylate uh, EIF2-alpha. How is PKR activated? Two molecules bind to double-stranded RNA. PKR consists of double-stranded RNA binding domains and a kinase domain. When two molecules are on the same RNA, they activate each other, they phosphorylate each other, now they can phosphorylate EIF2-alpha. So double-stranded RNA activates PKR, which then phosphorylates EIF2 and shuts down translation. By the way, there's also ways that cells can activate PKR. There are proteins called PACTs in the cell that will activate PKR in the absence of virus infection. So there are conditions in normal development and growth where you want to inhibit protein synthesis, and that's how it's done. It's done. So basically, PKR is a sensor of double-stranded RNA. It's actually induced by virus infection. It's an interferon-induced protein, as we'll see later. Viruses infect cells. They're sensed. The cells make PKR, but it's inactive. It gets activated by double-stranded RNA. It, it leads to inhibition of host translation. It also triggers apoptosis in cells. So phosphorylated EIF2-alpha is a trigger of programmed cell death. And the idea is you shut down translation, you kill the cell, and that limits 
virus spread, right? So it's a suicide response. Now, if, if viruses didn't encode an antagonist, they wouldn't be around. This is a really effective antiviral system. But almost every viral genome encodes some kind of antagonist of PKR. Otherwise, they're not much for this world, okay? And I want to tell you about some of those today. Here's one encoded in the adenovirus genome. So adenovirus makes lots of double-stranded RNA from divergent transcription of its DNA genome. And this will activate uh, PKR early in infection. Well, adenovirus makes an RNA called VARNA1. It's a Paul one produced RNA, very short, highly structured RNA shown here, which has the nice property of being able to bind one molecule of PKR and only one molecule. When only one molecule of PKR binds VARNA, it cannot be activated. You need to have two molecules binding a, a double-stranded RNA for PKR to be activated. So uh, PK, VARNA effectively blocks phosphorylation of PKR and activation and blocks shutdown of translation. So in an adenovirus-infected cell, instead of having double-stranded RNA activate PKR leading to protein synthesis inhibition, VARNA is made, which binds up uh, the PKR and prevents inhibition. Now the virus can make its proteins. So that's a cool method. And almost every virus, as I've said, has evolved some mechanism of in inhibiting this pathway, whether it's PERC or PKR. Those are the two relevant to virus infection. Again, PERC responds to ER stress. PKR responds to double-stranded RNA. Viruses encode antagonists of EIF2 where they mimic EIF2. So uh, the PKR is phosphorylating the virus mimic instead of EIF2, for example. Some viruses inhibit kinase in, uh, encode kinases inhibitors. Some viruses encode uh, double-stranded RNA binding proteins to block them up so they don't activate PKR. Antagonists of RNA, which we talked about, the adeno-VA RNA, they're also antagonists of the PKR protein. Every virus genome you study, you find antagonists of this pathway, and that's how powerful it is for its antiviral uh, properties. So our last question today is, PKR is an interferon-induced enzyme that is activated by what leading to phosphorylation of what and inhibition of translation? GDP, EIF2 alpha, DSRNA, EIF2 alpha, DSRNA, EIF2B, single-stranded RNA, EIF2 alpha, and none of the above. What's the right pair? Well, the right answer is B. Uh, PKR is activated by double-stranded RNA, leading to phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha. It's not activated by GTP. Uh, EIF2B is not phosphorylated, and it's not activated by single-stranded RNA. It's just double-stranded RNA, EIF2 alpha. Now, you may think that this is the end of the story, and if the virus can antagonize EIF2 alpha phosphorylation, that's the end of the story, but the cell fights back. So let's talk about that. When the cell senses that EIF2 is phosphorylated and translation is shut down, it has a stress response to that, and that's the formation of what are called stress granules. So we have translating um, mRNA is being translated by ribosomes, shown on the upper left. We have our circularized RNAs. These are being translated in a cap-dependent fashion. And the cell uh, has sensed the production of double-stranded RNAs. EIF2 alpha is phosphorylated. Viruses are trying to antagonize that. But before that can happen, the cell sensing EIF2 alpha phosphorylation, one of the outcomes can be apoptosis, programmed cell death. Another is complete shutdown of translation by the, by the cell. And that's via stress granules. So uh, these are very specific structures in the cytoplasm that form. And what the cell does is to shunt in mRNAs to them. mRNAs, including ribosomes on them, they're all shunted into this stress granule where translation then stops if it hasn't stopped already. And stress granules are made up of protein components plus the RNA and the ribosomes and all the associated factors. And some of the main components of stress granules include these proteins G3BP, TIA1, TIAR. So if a viral RNA is put into a stress granule, it's not going to be translated, right? So what do you do? Well, many viral genomes, as you might imagine, encode antagonists of stress granule formation. 
Otherwise, they can't be translated. As I said, this is, a, this is an arms race. You fight back and forth, virus cell. Uh, for example, um, RAP55 is an essential component of stress granules. Influenza virus has a protein called NS1 that prevents its incorporation into stress granules so they can't form. Hepatitis C virus grabs G3BP and puts it into its replication complex, actually uses it to replicate its RNA genome. So it prevents the formation of stress granules and instead uses this essential component, G3BP, to become part of its RNA polymerase complex. Poliovirus, one of the proteases of polio that cleaves the viral polyprotein, cleaves G3BP so that it cannot lead to the formation of stress granules. And that similar situations with other virus. Let's see, um, alpha viruses pull G3BP into their replication complexes, as do uh, other viruses as well. Oh, here's a cool one. I like this. Flavy viruses um, have a secondary structure in their genome, which binds specifically TIAR and G3BP. So that sequesters it away from a stress granule. And then the replication depends on the presence of these proteins. This is brilliant, right? The cell is making, mounting an antiviral strategy, so the virus is taking away those proteins that are essential for stress granule formation and using them for its own replication. It's like thumbing their nose at the cell. So the stress granule, again, is a way of shutting down protein synthesis. It's a uh, it's accompanied by the IF2 phosphorylation, if you will, and the virus is just going to reverse it uh, and prevent these from happening. So that's a response of the cell to virus infection. Viruses have other ways of modulating translation. So we talked about a way that a virus will overcome PKR phosphorylation, either prevent it or antagonize it in some way. But there are other mechanisms that the virus has to try and dominate the translational landscape in a cell because the, viral would, the virus would like all of its mRNAs on ribosomes and all of the tRNAs and all the factors dedicated to them and not to cellular mRNAs for obvious reasons. And so many viruses turn off protein synthesis in the cell, and they do so very early on before the cell can mount any kind of response. And here's an example of poliovirus inhibition of translation. So here's a graph showing you time after infection and the rate of protein synthesis on the y-axis. And uninfected cells, you know, you have a steady rate of protein synthesis. Cells infected with poliovirus, by two hours after infection, protein synthesis is completely inhibited, and it's replaced starting at three hours by viral protein synthesis. So you shut off the host and you replace it with virus, and eventually, by five hours, the cells are dead. On the right is a protein gel that illustrates this uh, quite visually. These are uh, cell proteins labeled, cell and viral proteins labeled with radioactive methionine at different times. After infection, 0, 1, 3, 5, and 7 hours. You see at 0 hours, a lot of cell proteins are made, the same at 1 hour. But already at 3 hours, a lot of the cell proteins, their, their translation has been shut off. They're replaced by viral proteins, which are these fat bands here. By 5 hours, only viral proteins are made. So that's one way. And there are many, there are dozens of examples of specific mechanisms by which viruses shut off host cell translation so that they can dominate uh, the production of protein with viral proteins. Here are some mechanisms, because I'm sure you're wondering, how does this happen? Um, and these all involve modulation of cap recognition, because remember the cells, mRNAs are capped, and they depend on cap recognition to get translation going. So if viruses can get around that, that's a good way to inhibit. So poliovirus, remember, uh, has an iris. It doesn't need a cap. So what it does is encode a protease called 2A or L, which cleaves EIF4G. And remember, EIF4G bridges 4E to, uh, the trans to the ribosome, essentially. And the cleavage of 4G in a polio or coronavirus-infected cell removes the N-terminus of 4G from the rest of the molecule. So that broken molecule can no longer translate cellular messages because the cap binding component has been separated from 4G, which is what brings the ribosome in to the message. But remember, coronavirus RNAs are not capped. They don't care about EIF4E. So they can be translated by internal ribosome entry. This is a very good strategy. You shut off the host and still allow viral messages uh, to proceed. Uh, other viruses, <clears throat> uh, adenovirus, influenza virus, 
uh, dephosphorylate EIF4E. Phosphorylation is needed for high affinity cap binding. And so you reduce the affinity, and even though the viral messages are capped, you can still get them translated because there's so many of them compared to cellular uh, messages. Uh, polio and another picornavirus, EMCV, uh, interfere also with a regulator of EIF4E. There's a protein in cell called 4EBP1, 4E binding protein uh, number one. Uh, this protein can bind EIF4E, and that will inhibit uh, translation. Uh, but uh, if it is dephosphorylated, um, it cannot inhibit uh, 4E anymore. So phosphorylation occurs near the 4E binding site. Phosphorylated 4E BP1 allows translation, uh, and what the viruses do is to dephosphorylate 4E BP1, so it binds up 4E, inhibits cap-dependent translation. And again, because um, the viruses don't need a cap, their translation can proceed. So those are just two or three ways that cap regulation can be modulated. There are lots of examples of initiation-dependent regulation uh, of translation. Again, the idea being the virus inhibits host cell translation and has all the mRNAs to itself, has the whole apparatus of translation to make its own proteins. <laughs>